The identities that exist within the animal kingdom are, for the most part, pretty straightforward. A bear is a bear, a swan is a swan, and a wolf is a wolf. He acts like a wolf, moves like a wolf, and quite essentially, looks like a wolf. But there is one notable exception among the land of the critters. Most of us are familiar with the creature that is quite literally synonymous with camouflage, the chameleon. But interestingly, the chameleon's ability to change colors has very little to do with camouflage. Instead, it's about social signaling. It's about expressing their intentions to their fellow chameleon friends or foes. For instance, chameleons tend to show brighter colors when displaying aggression and darker colors when they're submitting. Female chameleons use their outfit changes to sassily signal interest or rejection to males, while male chameleons use it to signal aggression or submission to other males, as well as to indicate interest towards potential lady lovers. For the chameleon, their ability to change colors isn't only about surviving physical threats, but also about navigating a social world of other little critters. When considering animal symbolism, you don't have to believe in spirit animals to know that the chameleon, of course, represents adaptation. And not only adapting physically, but also emotionally according to a given situation. They not only amend their hue according to their environment, but more specifically, how they feel about that environment and the creatures that populate it. They copy nature, and that is really rather magical. In a sense, chameleons are like the actors and actresses of the animal kingdom. And interestingly, and perhaps quite predictably, human actors and actresses are frequently quoted making this very comparison themselves. In the words of actor Freddie Fox, the joy of being a chameleon on stage is that you can be anything, and yet you're not any of those things as well. Or actor River Phoenix, I have a lot of chameleon qualities. I get very absorbed in my surroundings. Or actress Jane Fonda, I was a chameleon, the woman men wanted me to be. And so... The chameleon archetype is uncannily resonant among the acting class, a group whose success is entirely dependent on their ability to morph into a given role. This is literally their gift, to become someone else when others are watching. And many of us, whether we are actors or not, are chameleons in our own way. We change our colors, metaphorically speaking, depending on the set requirements, script, and cast we find ourselves with. Most essentially, we monitor ourselves, kind of like a meta stage director, to ensure that we are playing the proper part across a vast array of our life contexts. And when done mindfully, this monitoring can make us a smashing social success. We can woo and charm and fake it till we make it and achieve all the accoutrement of social success, like friends and lovers and the favor of professional colleagues. But some of us take this meta director role a bit too seriously. We may become so acutely aware of our stage cues that our theater becomes haunted by the phantom of our meta-director, a disembodied voice that urges us to smile or pout, flirt or be feisty, impress or express, even when that's not what's really real for us. The potential tragedy of this phantom hovering above us is that we may slowly but surely become possessed by its demands transforming ourselves into something else. Huh. 
Hi, I'm Jessica Carson, and welcome to Patina, a podcast that examines the surprising beauty of all that is dark, shadowy, and seemingly tarnished about the human experience. Let's play. Self-monitoring refers to the act of monitoring our own expressive behaviors and self-presentation. It reflects the varying degree of awareness that each of us has regarding situational appropriateness, social cues, behavioral control, and the ways in which we are able to use ourselves in different situations to obtain desirable outcomes. In short, Self-monitoring is completely essential to a reasonably healthy social self. I mean, let's be honest, if we didn't self-monitor at all, we would probably come across a bit psychotic. And just like the chameleon, our self-monitoring has both acquisitional and protective qualities. Acquisitive self-monitoring refers to the desire to get attention and approval from others, largely by altering our reactions or behavior to conform with a group. This is when we smile and giggle in the presence of a potential new partner. Protective self-monitoring, on the other hand, defends us from the judging eyes of others. It's when we modify our behavior, not necessarily to gain anything, but so we don't put our foot in our mouths and get eaten by a large predatory bird, metaphorically speaking. This is when we tamp down our urge to tell a dirty joke in the presence of our boss or our new boyfriend's parents. And the degree to which each of us self-monitors depends on the situation we're in. Many of us will shush that meta-director in our minds when we're with friends or partners or family members because, to be honest, we're not that worried about impressing them nor are we concerned that they will abandon us if we do or say the wrong thing. This is why we may zone out, burp, ugly cry, rant, express unpopular opinions, and engage in other questionable social activities when we are in the presence of those we trust. On the other hand, we are much more likely to self-monitor in environments like the workplace or a networking event in which we are rather invested in not finding ourselves with egg on our face, literally or metaphorically. Like, I mean, I always have food on my face. But even though we all vary in the intensity of our self-monitoring depending on the situation we're in, some of us are, on the whole, more intense self-monitors than others. Psychologists believe that we as humans tend to fall into one of two camps, low self-monitors or high self-monitors. Low self-monitors are those people who are unapologetically and oftentimes aggressively themselves. They don't really care what others think about them and are much more concerned with self-congruence and self-verification. In other words, they like to behave in alignment with who they think they are. When they feel or think something, they act on it, not wasting much spit considering the social repercussions of a potentially inflammatory, embarrassing, or less than flattering behavior. In fact, they are generally not very good at disguising behaviors, and this fact makes them remarkably consistent. The informality they display around their best friend is going to be quite similar to the way they relate to colleagues or strangers, because, well, they don't really care what you think about them. Rather interestingly, low self-monitors tend to date less, have fewer sexual partners, and choose partners who are less attractive but more sociable. Again, reinforcing the idea that they're just not that impressed by your Instagram face filter. At best, low self-monitors are fiercely authentic, unapologetic versions of themselves. Think the curmudgeonly charm of Stevie from Schitt's Creek, the feisty selfhood of Anthony Bourdain, 
or the quirky authenticity of Will Ferrell, Seth Rogen, or Jonah Hill in pretty much every movie they've ever been in. But at worst, low self-monitors can also present as the sloppy-looking fellow bumbling around the supermarket, blowing his nose as his holy sweatpants give off some kind of scent. Low self-monitoring has its upsides and downsides, for sure. But we will spend the remainder of today on us high self-monitors, those of us who are chameleons. Let me just start by saying, high self-monitoring is not the antithesis of authenticity, but it does mean that we are really very good at viewing each and every situation as an opportunity for a new acting role. And we are really excellent at it. We have the ability to play many different roles with behavior that is situationally specific, and we are very strategic in our self-presentation. The self that we are with our best friend is going to be very, very different from the self we are in the work meeting. And because of this, we tend to be rewarded. Like actors and actresses, us high self-monitors have the uncanny ability to track and modulate the image we put into the world. As a result, we tend to do better in social situations and the workplace. We know just how to say things to garner attention and approval. We don't find ourselves with our foot in our mouth as often as our low self-monitor friends. In true chameleon fashion, we can easily imitate the behaviors of others, put on a show to entertain others, or change our opinions to win the favor of others. And this may or may not come as a surprise, but when it comes to dating, we care a bit more than our low self-monitor peers about what our partners look like. In the workplace, us high self-monitors excel at attending to the cues and expectations of coworkers and bosses, exhibit stronger communication skills and persuasive ability, and thrive in boundary-spanning positions, which are jobs that require employees to communicate with others and filter information. Perhaps unsurprisingly, us high self-monitors are also perceived as being better leaders. We just know how to play the part. While high self-monitoring may sound egocentric or manipulative or inauthentic, that's not necessarily the case. There's a lot of lightness that comes along with being a high self-monitor. We are excellent at changing behaviors that aren't working, engaging the impact of our behavior on a situation, particularly in competitive environments. Think cutthroat offices or bars with a lot of romantic competition. Our interpersonal skills are stellar as we have the capacity to develop deeper self-awareness as well as an awareness of other people. High self-monitoring can even benefit our physical health as we are better at noticing the symptoms that may require treatment. We are acutely aware of what's happening to us and that can be a really useful thing. But high self-monitoring, as you can likely imagine and see coming because, well, we always like to look at the dark side on this podcast, comes with its fair share of shadows as well. The painting featured in this episode was painted by a man named Thomas Barker in 1789. And in fact, Thomas Barker is in the painting himself. He is the figure sitting at the easel, while Charles Spackman, his preceptor, hovers rather forebodingly behind him. Thomas Barker was the oldest son of a failed barrister, a lawyer of the time, who was raised under difficult circumstances. Despite his struggles, however, it became clear early on that Thomas was a skilled painter. 
One day, at the age of 13, Thomas's talents were spotted by a coach builder, Charles Spackman, who agreed to take Thomas under his wing. But while Thomas was a talented painter, to be sure, he started and finished his career as a copycat. He copied the old masters and became known for a body of work that was repetitive and of unpredictable quality. Art historians today note that Thomas, while talented, lacked originality and, likely under the pressure of Charles Spackman, spent his career copying others without developing his own sense of style or originality. Though we do not know Thomas Barker's personality precisely, we can glean from the details of his life that he had some high self-monitor tendencies. He wanted to please, to mimic, to impress. He was a mighty talented fellow, but his fixation on replication versus originality was what led him to ultimately die in debt. He was a chameleon and that didn't serve him so well. This is the shadow that's alive within us high self-monitors. Self-monitoring becomes a problem when we are doing it not from a place of intentional growth, but from a place of anxiety or hypervigilance. In fact, many of us may self-monitor because of social anxiety, a feeling of being uncomfortable in social settings, and pay far too much attention to how others act around us or perceive us. The phantom meta director in our minds may make it almost impossible to truly sink into a social situation and be ourselves in the presence of others. At worst, our hyper-awareness can lead to a self-consciousness that can make us appear anything but genuine. In fact, us high self-monitors are often accused of being inconsistent and unpredictable because we can change our colors so often and so dramatically based on who we're with or the outcome we're trying to achieve. We can be so strategic in our self-presentation that we can lose the best thing about ourselves, which is ourselves. While many of us know a truly toxic high self-monitor, someone who is completely manipulative, inauthentic, and can put on a show just to get what they want, this is not the image of high self-monitoring that I want to leave you with. Because the truth is, us high self-monitors are intensely essential to the social cohesion of the world around us. We are like the empathetic social glue in a sense. Because we are so aware of social reactions, we notice when others feel marginalized in a group setting and are often quick to make them feel included. We bridge gaps by keeping social decorum and contributing to social cohesion, a skill that low monitors don't have as much of. At its heart, self-monitoring is really just an awareness of self and others. To drive this point home, let me tell you a rather unflattering personal story. When I was younger, I moved around a lot. I went to three different high schools over the span of four years, ultimately spending the majority of my high school years at a charter school in Georgia. But here's the thing. I'm not from the South, and honestly, I didn't really get the culture. Nothing against it, it just wasn't for me. The tailgating, the football, the fried food, the monogrammed everything. I felt totally adrift. But as the overachieving high self-monitor that I was and still am, although now to a more productive and balanced degree, I worked really, really hard to try to fit in. But I wasn't met with immediate success, especially after one incident in English class. A few weeks after starting with this new school, my English teacher asked me to read a passage from a class book. I was happy to do so, as I had always had a strange affinity for public speaking, even as a young child. But 
While I was reading, something unfortunate happened. I couldn't get out of my own head and began tripping over some words, which didn't seem like a big deal until my English teacher stopped me and exclaimed, Jessica, you are bright red. Why are you blushing? Are you okay? The whole classroom whipped around and my face started to grow hotter and hotter, leaving me trapped in my chair, a seat from which I couldn't escape, but desperately wanted to. Now, I know this may seem like a run-of-the-mill childhood experience, but my inner high self monitor took this experience very, very seriously, and frankly, ran with it. Ran far. From that day onward, through till about some point in college, I blushed profusely whenever I was called to speak. Because my self-monitoring mind was so hyper-aware of what was going on inside of my body, as well as how other people were responding to me, the blushing became an unfortunate side effect that I couldn't shake for a long, long time. I couldn't figure out what was worse, being uncomfortable because I was blushing, or feeling as though I was making other people uncomfortable because they were watching me be uncomfortable. I just couldn't seem to smother the phantom metacritic in my head that insisted I would blush if confronted socially, which of course perpetuated my fears around not fitting in. And so I tell you this story to make high monitoring a bit more relatable and innocent and not so manipulative, because at the end of the day, there is a tiny self within all of us that just wants to fit in have friends, and not be caught scarlet-cheeked in front of your prom date. And honestly, the more I have connected with that innocent yearning to fit in, the more compassion I've had for my own self-monitoring as an adult. It doesn't come from a place of inauthenticity, self-hatred, or manipulation, but instead from a very true, very deep part of me, and likely you as well, that just wants to be loved. In the words of the late father of American psychology, William James, whenever two people meet, there are really six people present. There is each man as he sees himself, each man as the other person sees him, and each man as he really is. We all wear a variety of colors to camouflage and charm and fluff ourselves into positions of authority. And that's okay, as long as we are always aware of what is real and what is not, what is authentic and what is copycatting. What is social empowerment and what is personal disempowerment? I know the line can feel a bit fuzzy at times and that's okay too. For us high self monitors, it is part of the great work of our lifetimes to learn how to use this vigilant ability in our favor rather than have it work against us. It's easier said than done, but I believe it's possible. Even the greatest of the greats have their high self-monitoring moments. I will leave you with the words of someone who, in my opinion, is a textbook case of a brilliant high self-monitor, Taylor Swift. With her lyrics, I'm still on that tightrope. I'm still trying everything to get you laughing at me. I'm still a believer, but I don't know why. I've never been a natural. All I do is try, try, try. I'm still on that trapeze. I'm still trying everything to keep you looking at me. Because I'm a mirror ball. I'll show you every version of yourself tonight. That's all for today's episode of Patina. 
written and produced by me, Jessica Carson, with the help of my partner in crime, Jeffrey Sayers. With any luck, it's helped you to look into a shadowy aspect of your human experience with a bit more hope and a lot more curiosity. If you like Patina, I think you'll really enjoy our other offerings from online courses. If you like Patina, I think you'll really enjoy my other offerings from online courses to books to group and individual coaching and consulting. I warmly invite you as a seeker to dive deep with me into all that is beautiful about the shadows within yourself, your company, your relationships, and our society at large. So give me a follow or drop me a note on how we can play together. After all, the shadows are a lot more friendly when we play. <laughs>